All right, so hi everybody. Welcome back to our C++ programming lecture. And this lecture is actually the last lecture in terms of serious contents. So today we are going to discuss um, about program analysis in general. And in the next lecture next week, I'm just going to present the final project that you will eventually need to solve in order to pass that course and also some advanced techniques and um, like fun concepts but no real serious content so this is kind of the last lecture all right so let's see what this is all about um, we will discuss about cyber attacks program analysis already mentioned that um, a bit more in detail even, we will discuss why we need program analysis. So why is it a good thing to employ program analysis? Um, we will specifically talk about static program analysis because that is what I do in my day-to-day -day job. And then I will also hint you to Eric Bodden's course, uh, Designing Code Analysis, DECA 1 and 2, which you Probably if you watch those lecture recordings here, if you watch them on YouTube, you already figured out um, where to find the Dika course. Uh, but uh, just to be complete, I also want to mention uh, it explicitly. And then at last, we are always looking for good people. So we are uh, typically always having jobs, open jobs. And um, also we have some thesis you can work on. So if you need to write your bachelor or master thesis, just drop me an email and then we see if we can distribute uh, those requests um, to our colleagues and um, find a topic that you're interested in that you could use uh, for your final thesis. Okay, so let's start. Usual cyber attack. So what is a cyber attack and why is that important and all that good stuff? So you can read in yeah, probably in, in the newspaper every day that some cyber attack has been uh, successfully executed, right? And um, you know about ransomware, uh, hackers taking down fuel pipelines in the United States and all that good stuff. Um, I mean, that's not good, of course, but how is a cyber attack typically executed? So the first thing that an attacker must do is, of course, to find a vulnerability or sometimes even before that place a backdoor, backdoor in the first place. That can also happen, um, which is yeah quite unfortunate, right? So if people on purpose place backdoors, but I guess those attackers don't really care. Then you need to inject malicious code at some point, right, to infect the system. And uh, you also, of course, need to stay undercover. So you need to circumvent detection. You need to surveil the system and infect more machines if required or if possible. That's typically also a good thing in terms of being an attacker. And then at some point you execute your payload and um, do some harm. And now the question is, okay, I mean, we, we need about, uh, we read about those uh, cyber attacks in the newspaper every day, almost every day. And now the question arises, yeah, I mean, who is responsible um, for the attacks to succeed? So who's to blame? And a study by the US Department of Homeland Security found that uh, more than 90% of all current cyber attacks succeed because of vulnerabilities in the application layer. So it's your fault basically, because typically most of you will be um, working on the application layer later on. So that's not good. You should improve on that definitely. So how can we improve? Um, how can we reduce the number of vulnerabilities in our systems, in our programs? First of all, you should write your code when you're most concentrated. I guess that is a rather natural one. So write your code carefully. I guess that's that's <laughs> that's pretty much clear, right? Then once you wrote your code, um, you should also test your code and see if it does the expected thing, right? So you can, for instance, employ unit tests 
to ensure correctness of your programs, at least to some extent. Namely, for the given test, you can nail it down that the program has the exact behavior that you specified in your unit test that, that can be done. And that's the first problem here, because I mean, if I read some student code or probably, I mean, I myself wrote such code, right? And I uh, pretty much never tested it. Um, so, and <laughs> I don't know, sometimes it also happens in production. I don't know, false, I never test my code like this guy here. Uh, that's not a good thing really. And if you start testing your program, even if it seems to run correctly, if you start testing your code, you will find issues. You will find bugs and um, vulnerabilities and those can then be fixed, right? Next, next you can use dynamic analysis. Mm. For instance, you can use the Clang sanitizers. You can, um, what else can you do? You can use Valgrind to check if your program contains any memory issues or memory leaks. So that is pretty much dynamic analysis. That is pretty cheap and pretty easy to use. And typically you will also be finding lots of bugs and vulnerabilities in your programs. Then there's something called static analysis. We will talk about what that is in detail in just a few seconds. And that is for instance one technique so static analysis is one technique that your optimizing compiler typically uses as a basis for the compiler optimization, all right? So what the compiler does is the compiler runs some static analyses on your program to determine some interesting program properties. And those findings, those program properties that could be uh, verified for your piece of program, for your code, um, can then be used as a basis for compiler optimization. That is the idea here. And then of course you can use manual reviews like real humans reviewing each other's code. And that is hopefully standard nowadays. At least it's used quite a lot, which is a really good thing. It's a bit more expensive of, of course. How does it work? Typically you develop your code in some um, version control system like Git, for instance, and then maybe you even have a platform such as GitHub or GitLab or whatnot. Mm. And then you develop your code in small commits. You develop a new feature, for instance, commit it, push it into your development branch or master branch, not directly, but rather you would create a pull request. And then you can add some other guy in your company as a reviewer. And this guy then has to review your code and give, he or she can give you feedback on your code or improve or even detect some mistakes or whatnot. And um, only if he or she gives his or her okay, then the code can be merged with the master or development branch uh, depending, on, depending what you're working on. That can of course also be used. So we have one problem, however, especially in the static analysis um, field, and that problem originates from Rice's theorem, uh, which was established in 53. So what is that theorem stating? Let's have a look. The bad thing really is that program analysis is mathematically provable hard. So it's, it's really a tough problem here. Because all, all non-trivial semantic properties of a program are undecidable. And what does that mean? I mean, you can't have a general algorithm which can solve that problem for all instances. And the semantic property is one about the behavior of a program. An example, does a program terminate for all inputs? That would be an example property that you could ask about your program's behavior. And a property is non-trivial if, 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 if it is neither true for every program nor for no program. I guess that is rather natural. Um, but then if uh, the property is neither of those things, then it is non-trivial. And those include quite a lot of properties, I guess, you can only imagine. 
If you wish to learn more details about this theorem and you can just look it up on Wikipedia, there is the, the, the actual proof is, is quite, uh, yeah, quite hard, I would say. Uh, but the Wikipedia entry contains a proof sketch, which you can pretty easily follow. So if you are interested in that, you can have a look. And um, okay, that means we can't compute exact solutions. That's pretty bad, but what can we do instead? What, what might be still useful? We can use over approximations or sometimes even also under approximations. So, so we need to approximate, right? In order to be able to compute anything of use really. And for the most part, that's still, that's still okay. So we can still get results that are interesting and relevant and useful to us. So analyzing programs, what can you do? You can use static analysis, which I already mentioned, right? And that is white box analysis. Um, that is an analysis that has access to everything. So typically for static analysis, you need to have all of your source code. And then the analysis is typically run on your source code, including configuration files and, and all, all the good stuff. So that is also oftentimes called white box analysis. So you have access to everything. On the other hand, we have something which is called uh, black box analysis. And uh, in, in that kind of analysis, you typically don't have the source code. What you only have is, um, for the most part, an executable binary, for instance. And uh, you don't know anything else about that. Um, exactly. So you only have a binary, no source code, no documentation, no configuration files. And then you have to figure out what the program does, really, and uh, you need to find some interesting properties on the program's behavior. So what does it mean? So we have white box and black box analysis. So what is, uh, what about the details here? Um, in static analysis, you retrieve information about a program currently under analysis without executing it. So in static, anal in static analysis, you are really only just looking at the program and try to figure out what it does. Um, such an analysis is performed on the source code in some cases, but also in a large number of cases, it's typically uh, run on some intermediate code. We will see later on in today's lecture why that is useful to not run your source code, uh, why not to run your static analysis directly on the source code, but rather uh, running it on some intermediate code. Uh, and here, static analysis, of course, we have to approximate. Oftentimes, we need some over approximations. In some cases, we can also under approximate. It depends on the problem we wish to solve. Dynamic analysis, on the other hand, again, maybe let's um, get into more details here. That is retrieving information about a program's behavior with um, yeah, without kind of looking at the source code, but by executing it and see how it behaves, what it actually does, given some inputs. So you can run it on a real processor, but you can also run your binaries that you wish to analyze, um, especially if you don't know the origin of those binaries, could be malicious code, um, then sometimes you also wish to run it on a virtual processor such that it can't do any harm, right? You, you will um, execute it then in some virtual environment. And um, those binary programs, or yeah, um, those, must be, those must be executed with sufficient test inputs in order to get coverage, right? Why is that? I mean, programs typically have uh, some branching going on. So you have ifs and elses, and then you have some loops and control flow, right? And um, in order to figure out the program's properties, you wish to have multiple runs of that binary and you need to give it some inputs. And then you, you must have your program at best executing all different program paths that are possible in order to, in order to uh, make a statement about the program's behavior, right? And if you don't reach all, or if you can't really access all program or the behavior of all program paths that are possible, 
then you are, you are forget, you forget some program behavior, so which you don't see, right? Because you never hit that path uh, of your program. So you only discover a set of possible paths. Typically, you never reach 100% coverage. That's uh, usually uh, pretty much impossible. Um, so that would be an under approximation because you only discover a subset of all possible behaviors where on static analysis side, you can have an over approximation because instead on static analysis side, you um, can discover all behaviors on all along all program paths. All right. Also keep in mind the uncertainty principle. Um, so make sure that the code instrumentation that you're used to run and inspect your program in dynamic analysis does not cause any side effects. That is also very important. And then as a third part, really we have program understanding and that is done by humans. That is program comprehension, that is code reviews and that is also software walkthroughs. And you can imagine that um, program understanding, because it's done by humans, that cannot be automated, automated, that is very, very expensive. That is expensive to do. Okay, so uses of static analysis. So let's um, dive a bit uh, deeper into static analysis. It really originates from compiler optimization. So the goal of compilers, of course, is to produce fast and efficient code. And um, so I already mentioned it briefly. So what the compiler does, it runs some analyses on your program to figure out some properties that can then be used to optimize the code. Very simple example, say the compiler runs a static analysis and the compiler figures out and can prove using a static analysis that uh, some portion of your code can never be executed. No matter which program path is taken, it can never be executed. I mean, that would be a dead code analysis. And I mean, if code can never be executed, the compiler can just throw it away. The compiler does not need um, to generate object code for that, right? That would be one very simple analysis and optimization based on top of it. Then nowadays also we use it for bug finding and finding vulnerabilities. Um, that's um, pretty good, I guess, right? So, and it's then for, the, for those reasons also popular in industry for companies producing their own software product. Like all the large companies, Google, Facebook, Oracle, I don't know, pick any large company that produces their own software product. Um, all those companies employ static analysis in order to find bugs and detect vulnerabilities. So you can either deploy it as part of your nightly build, for instance, or you can use it at the very end of the development phase. So first you develop your software product and then at the very end, finally, you run a huge static analysis on, um, or multiple typically, on the, um, program on the software product a product in order to find out uh, bugs right but um, of course you can imagine what what would be the better approach the better approach is to run it more frequently right um, but we have one problem which i um, care to explain later on in this lecture and that is static analysis oftentimes does not scale very well so it can be that uh, if you use a whole program analysis it can run for multiple days and it can take huge amount of memory in order to get any interesting results. Um, so it's sometimes a bit on the expensive side, depending on what you wish to find out. And of course, uh, the early error is not only the good error, but also the cheap error. Um, because if you detect errors early on, you can fix them and then it's typically not that expensive. But uh, once you um, continue in your software pro uh, uh, in your software development phase, uh, it, it gets more and more expensive, right? And once you already sh shipped your pro product, then it, it's really expensive because um, oftentimes then you get need to get your product back into your company to fix that issue and then hand it back to the customer, right? Um, so airbags, 
is a good point, right? So there have been cases where um, certain types of airbags um, have been male, male functioning. And because that's really, really dangerous, um, those cars had to go back in the workshop and uh, needed to be fixed, right? All right, and then they could be given back to the drivers, to the customers, to the owners. And that is really expensive. And that is in fact so expensive that it has been known that some companies, although they know that the product contains a bug, a serious bug, a serious issue, because that cost to fix that later on then is so expensive that they just keep it secret until something happens and then it might be um, less expensive to just pay the guy or what's left of that guy um, with some, uh, pay the guy with some money and then it might be cheaper. From a moral standpoint, I don't know. Um, think about it yourself. Um, <laughs> static analysis, yeah, I myself use it to find bugs and secu security vulnerabilities and um, that is probably me on some ordinary day, so I see bugs everywhere. Not saying I never write some bad code, so that also occasionally happens. So. Mm. But I <clears throat> have, um, I now show you some examples. So let's first of all maybe talk about C and C++ um, as languages themselves and um, let's also discuss their implementations, typically their compilers, right? Because compilers are also just pieces of software which translate your source code into some machine code. And most common compilers for C and C++ are of course GCC, Right, you have then Clang LLVM is also available, and then you have MSVC like Microsoft's uh, Micro, Microsoft Visual Studio compiler. And there has been a paper at the ISTA conference in 2016, which is, was called, or is called uh, Toward Understanding Compiler Bugs in GCC and LLVM, and they looked at compiler bugs, right? And what was the most buggy component in compilers? Um, yeah, take a quick guess. It was C++. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can only imagine because C++ is quite a complex language and then you can imagine that, okay, compilers are probably also a bit on the complex side. And in both compilers, so in GCC and LLVM, C++ was the most buggy component and um, accounting for 20% of the total number of bugs in compilers. And the interesting thing is that uh, the compiler bugs can be found and triggered in programs with yeah, much less than 45 lines of code really. And uh, what do I mean by compiler bugs? So <laughs> there are sometimes you can write programs which bring your compiler to crash, right? So if you try to compile a piece of program then the compiler just crashes with an internal compiler error, oftentimes referred to as ICE, internal compiler error. And okay, so this paper only analyzed uh, GCC and Clang, but uh, you can believe me, the MSVC compiler has its own problems. Okay, <laughs> so now, I mean, compilers also contain bugs and maybe now let's also present some kind of bugs that can be found or have been found by static analysis tools Let's have a few examples here that have been found in open source C and C++ projects. And I'm not going to present you 100 bucks, of course, for the sake of like time restriction here. You can uh, look uh, that blog post up yourself. Here is the link and I just um, present you some examples here. Those have been the two guys who found all those bugs and um, yeah, using static analysis just to give you an idea what can be found. And the projects include like known projects, so the Apache HTTP server, Chromium, CMake, MySQL, Qt, Tortoise, SVN, and so on. Let's have an example. Let's have an example taken from the Wolfenstein 3D project, um, passing the wrong size. So here's a piece of code. <coughs> What do we have here? So we have a pointer to a thingy. Uh, of course, I'm leaving out some code here, otherwise it, it wouldn't fit on the slide. So we have a pointer to some type, right? And oftentimes what you need to do 
many, many times in order to start your computations or sometimes in the middle. But anyways, oftentimes you need to zero out memory. And there's the, the, that old function called memset, which is a C function. And how does it work? The memset function takes a pointer to some piece of memory. Then you can uh, give a value that should be written in that piece of memory and then you give it a size. So meaning from that pointer pointing to the beginning of that memory and then given size, all those memory cells will be zeroed out. Right? That is the purpose of memset in 99% in of the cases. And what's the matter here with that code? Um, what's not used correctly is the size of operator here. So size of either takes a type and then it returns the number of bytes it takes to store that type in memory, or it takes an expression that is then evaluated and then the, the, the type of that expression is determined by the compiler and then it gives you the number of uh, the number of bytes of that type that has been um, assigned to that expression. And so let's have a look. So what do we have here? We have item info is a pointer, right? It's a variable of type pointer to an item info. Then we take the address, which is a pointer to a pointer of item infos. And the size of a pointer is eight bytes on most modern machines. So memset here only sets the first eight bytes to zero. And maybe they are, are in this project, there was more memory that should have been zeroed out, but um, yeah, because size of has not been used correctly because size of was not the right thing to do here to determine the uh, size uh, of that memory. Similar thing here, size of also used incorrectly. So what you do is you, you also use ancient C style fu or C functions, str n compare. So Still n compare, you can look it up in the C or C++ documentation. It compares the first n characters of strings. So you give it some strings that it should, or give it some pointers to strings that it should compare, and then you give it a number of bytes. So how many bytes of those two strings must be equal such that these strings are considered to be equal. And a size of also was used incorrectly here. So in, in that case, also only the very first characters are compared against each other. Um, that was not very good, of course. And um, what the intention was good, because what has not been used was a strill compare. There's also a function string compare, uh, which misses that n and which does not take a length. And so string compare tries to compare to strings until the um, special backslash zero, the terminal C string character is detected, which is pretty fragile. So you should always use a strill n compare, um, which was a good idea here, but then the size of operator was used incorrectly. So another good thing here is um, uh, this example here where, um, yeah, some stuff is happening and uh, right, you have some array here on the stack somewhere. And um, that's not particularly good, right? Because it has nine elements. And so the valid range of indices is from zero to eight. So, and here a nine has been given, which is not right, right? Um, so this M at the position nine would actually not read the ninth element of that um, array M but it would rather read the value of bias because that's the next thing that is behind uh, the array in that memory. So that's not correct, right? What else do we have in the Tortoise SVN project? Um, we have a thing here, we have a piece of code which only wishes to allow one sender. So if um, the thing has some size, um, the developer tried to like, clear the container and um, remove all the elements and then just push push back one one address here, whatever that means in that context. The problem here being that empty does not modify the container at all. As many of you know, hopefully, empty, yeah, first of all, please learn the STL. 
And empty just checks if the container is empty, so it returns just true or false, depending whether the container is empty. Um, and that was not intended. So what was intended here in that uh, piece of code was to clear the container and then the correct function would be clear, which removes all the elements of the container. What else do we have? Um, is point valid? So let's check if a bool is valid and then let's check the same bool value or bool variable again and then combine the result with the logical end, which is rubbish, right? So what was meant in the second case, uh, in the second place here uh, would be is point y valid? So that, that other variable, right? So that code was not intended and does not work. Um, okay, now <laughs> I, I leave the joke. So may, maybe, okay, now I bring it. Um, Maybe that code could be correct if your program has some other race conditions and then the, the variable is point x is valid, is, uh, could be changed in between or so, but uh, if your program is correct, then that code here is incorrect. What else cool stuff do we have? We have an infinite loop here um, introduced by accident. We decrement some size variable here and check if that thing is greater or equal to zero. And the funny thing is that that variable size is of type size t. And size t is something um, like unsigned long long. So the exact size and bytes, bytes can vary, but the keyword here is unsigned. So that thing can never be smaller than zero. And if it is zero and then you decrement, then it just overflows and starts from a very large number again. And overflow for unsigned types is well defined, so that would be even defined behavior. Um, but what you would have here is an infinite loop, and uh, that was typically not, in, uh, I mean, that was not intended here, right? So that's an issue. What else do we have? We check the same pointer, um, that password variable, which is a pointer, we check if that is null. And then again, we check if that is null, because you have to know that this special terminal character here for C style string, that backslash zero, that is in memory, that is just a zero byte. Everything is zero. So and zero is null and null is zero. So you do the ch uh, same check for null um, two times, which was not intended. So the idea here in the second check, of course, was to check if that string only carries the null byte um, stating that the string is empty. So, but then you would need to dereference that pointer with an asterisk here. So that is rubbish. Um, exactly. So something like that was meant, hopefully. Um, what else? What else? If you have a look at the Chromium project, um, <laughs> Here we check if a pointer is null, right? So if the plugin instance, and then we, which is a pointer, which can be zero, then it would be false. And if it's something else in zero, so stating if it's a valid pointer, then it would evaluate to true. That's the handy trick that the programmers always use as a shorthand here. And so what you're basically doing here is um, that not plugin instance evaluates to true whenever plugin instance is a null pointer. So, and what you're doing is here, you check, okay, if I have a null pointer, then I just call something on the null pointer. I just call a member function here, or I, I access some data here on that null pointer, which is of course terrible because that's right undefined behavior, segmentation fault. Uh, you cannot dereference the null pointer. Then once again, because it's so funny size of issue here, um, th this time in that scenario, um, I mean, the asterisk is uh, un uh, not unnecessary. The asterisk is actually false, it's wrong. So if you would have written that code without that asterisk here, the code would be correct, but that way the code is incorrect. Um, once again, we need to zero out some memory using an all C function. And we have an array called buffer with 64 elements. Uh, of some, I don't know, uint1 size, it's probably a byte or so. Um, would need to look it up within that project here, of course. But then um, what do we do? We give it a pointer to the first element. And then what we do is buffer is kind of a pointer and then we dereference it here. So we are getting the first element. 
which is of type unsigned in one, which is a byte. So we are only zeroing out the first byte, which is uh, not very good because we have not zeroed out the remaining 63 bytes here stored in that buffer. So, yeah. Okay, and that is a security critical function, right? Um, and I, I guess you can see here now, oftentimes all C functions have been used, like str n compare and size of and da -da 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 to get the number of bytes. Blah, 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 blah. Why don't you just use C++, which has stood string as a data type, which you can compare and you can be sure that it does the right thing. Why not use a vector? or a std array, if you wish to have it on the stack, which knows its size, you can just call the member function dot size and it gives you the number of elements and then you, you can do much better. There's, um, a uh, there's a function in the STL algorithms header which is called fill and then you can fill some container with all zeros and I mean it's, it's much easier, much faster to use than trying to go like real low level and um, you see it, it's so easy to make mistakes here. Um, yeah, I guess I, I just skipped that here because again, string comparisons are done incorrectly, forgot to dereference and, and all that stuff, yeah, right? So that is really bad. So uh, yet another thing just that was probably auto completion of the um, developer's editor, right? And then he just um, put delivery password two times. The login, however, or the username is never checked. Okay, not, not very good. So let's have a look at the characteristics of C and C++. So what comes to my mind and probably also to your mind in many cases is that yeah, okay, C and C++ are old, are very powerful, very expressive, but also for that reason, very complex. Uh, some people call it expert friendly and not in a good way. Um, a million rules to remember. For instance, uh, and that has been pointed out to me by uh, Scott Myers, and um, there was some guy called Tom Cargill in 1990, uh, uh, who asked the question, and you can ask such a question in C++, uh, what is a protected abstract virtual base pure virtual private destructor, and when was the last time you needed one? And that thing, the thing what he meant was uh, the following was this, this thingy here, so you can have such a thing, <laughs> such a thing in C++. You of course never need it, but um, just to prove point how powerful this language is. Um, okay, that's on the one hand, right? But in reality, oftentimes it's like unconcentrated developers. It's like calling the wrong function, calling empty instead of clear forgot to dereference a pointer, like in the examples I just showed you, that has been the case an overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly majority of times. Size of operator, which can't be used correctly. I mean, that's, that's pretty bad. So that's, then you forget how to code, essentially. And uh, by using C++ and the more recent standards, that can be mitigated to some large extent. And what you can't mitigate, that can be done by static analysis, for instance. So, and also the problem is, of course, C and C++ are basically everywhere. So we have to get it right. So when performance matters, and that's typically in, in, in almost all cases, because if performance does not matter to you, you wouldn't use C++, right? So if you use C++, you already have a huge problem to solve. Um, because if you would need to solve an easy problem, you would probably go for Python or Java, or C Sharp, or I don't know, pick your favorite language here, which is not C or C++. So if you need to solve the hard problems, if performance really matters, like operating systems, C, C++ are the languages of choice. Embedded systems, right? Then you need to have very little memory footprint, like uh, software running on washing machines or something, oftentimes written in C or C++. Simulations, real-time systems, browsers, and the list goes on and on and on. And then some people, <laughs> I always like that, make fun of programming languages such as Java or C-sharp, 
because some people call, just call it, uh, I mean, Java and C Sharp, those are just C++ applications. And in some way, they are actually. Uh, so yeah, always a war between the Java, C Sharp, and the C++ guys. So um, to detect those issues I just showed, you can use static analysis because static analysis has been used to find those issues I just presented to you. So to use uh, to reduce the number of coding mistakes. How does it work? So what there's a recipe which I I'm going to present here. So first of all, of course, you need to become aware of a bug or vulnerability, right? Then you need to understand the bug. You can then write a static analysis that finds this particularly kind of this particular kind of bug. Then you run your analysis on the code, and the analysis will report back, hopefully, <laughs> some potential findings. And the potential findings you did you, you then need to check. And if you as a developer can confirm that this is an actual bug, you would fix it, of course. And this recipe here that is usually integrated in some build pipeline such that an analysis automatically triggers once you push some commit um, into your software project's version control system, right? So now I'm getting a bit more concrete. Let's now have a look on some relatively simple kind of static analysis data flow analysis and data flow analysis in itself is not simple, but I only present you simple examples here um, such that you can understand what's going on and what is the general concept. Um, so let's talk about intra procedural data flow analysis and intra meaning we only analyze one function at a time. We will also learn in just a few seconds or minutes why inter procedural so an analysis that spans multiple functions can be really hard to implement and to run. But now let's have a look at, um, at analysis running on one function at a time. Okay, how does it work? We have some function f that we are interested in. And for that function f, we wish to verify some property phi. So we wish to check if some property phi holds for that given function f that we wish to analyze. And in order to get that done is, uh, yeah, we would come up with an analysis that checks if the property holds for function f. So an, a concrete analysis always answers the question or a question of the type, does property phi hold at statement s within that function f? That's how it works. So to, uh, Give you a better feeling, let's present some properties and corresponding analyses. And um, is this variable still used later on? That would be a live variables analysis that answers that question. Can this code ever execute? I already mentioned that example right at the beginning. So that would be a dead code analysis. And if your compiler detects such dead code, it would just throw it away. It would not even generate code for it. Can this pointer be null or ever be null? That would be a nullness analysis. Um, is this file handle ever closed? That's also very important analysis, by the way, which is called a type state analysis. Can sensitive data leak? That is typically a question you can ask to detect SQL injections and cross-site scripting attacks and you can detect all those kinds of things with that. And uh, the analysis for that would be a taint analysis that checks if a taint value generated by some source can reach a sync, which is a critical function, which yeah should not output uh, or process tainted values. And of course, there are many, many more. So what is the workflow of data flow analysis? First thing that you do is you would pass the function that you wish to analyze as source code, but typically as bytecode or some other intermediate representation because those are uh, much easier to analyze. So you have that function that you wish to analyze. You would say you have passed it into some format that you can process and write algorithms for. And um, next thing you would do is you would convert or you would 
computes the control flow graph of, of that piece of program. So that would be the control flow graph here of that uh, small program of that uh, code fragment here. And then the analysis is performed on the control flow graph on the CFG. And then you hopefully are able to find interesting properties. So why intermediate representation? Analysis, at least in the field I'm working on, uh, the analysis is usually performed on some intermediate representation, oftentimes also called IR for short. That is simpler than the source language. You of course know that C++ can be very, uh, very difficult, very complex, also complex in terms of tokens. So you can, the syntax is brutal. I mean, there's so much possibilities how to spell out some stuff, but um, you ask your compiler to produce some intermediate representation, which is much easier because it only has a limited number of syntax elements. It has only a limited number of simple instructions, which the compiler, it boils it down to which makes it much more easy, uh, much easier to analyze. So it comprises only a few opcodes, a few instructions, add, mult, uh, subtract, divide, and modulus, and, uh, function call, and maybe even. Um, um, it uses jumps, so go-tos instead of loops, because loops have um, one problem. You can nest loops to some really huge depth and that would make an analysis on the source code really, really hard to implement. Mm, but if you ask the compiler to boil it down to simple jumps, which the processor eventually sees anyways, because I mean, there are no loops on, on your processor, right? So it can only do some jumps. <clears throat> that is much easier to analyze for a static um, analysis algorithm, a data flow analysis algorithm. Um, the particular framework I'm working with is called LLVM. I mentioned it a few times already, and um, I also showed you um, some LLVM IR in, in, on some occasions in, in the exercise classes, I guess, right? So LLVM is a piece of compiler infrastructure. You can think of it as a huge C++ library for building compilers and uh, compiler-related tools. And it also comes with some um, binaries, some tool chain, which yeah, allows you to operate with that compiler infrastructure. It provides really many helpful mechanisms to write your own compiler optimizations. So if you wish to write your own compiler optimization, just write some LLVM optimization pass and you're done. So that's really easy to, to get your hands uh, on. And when I say really, really easy, I mean it's hard, but LLVM is still the easiest choice available. Mm, I once tried to do some stuff with GCC and the GCC code base is really brutal. So I also don't know many people who work with GCC in, in terms of optimization and writing their own optimizations and analyses. Um, LLVM is a bit more friendly in that regard. And you can, of course, also not only write your own compiler optimizations, but also static analyses. And typically, both work kind of together. Together, You would write your static analysis, and uh, based on the information provided by the analysis, you would build your compiler optimization. It has an own intermediate representation, which is called LLVMIR. It's independent of the concrete input source language, so you can ask the Clang compiler, and the Clang compiler is part of the LLVM project. You can ask the Clang compiler to generate intermediate representation, not only for C and C++, but also for Objective-C and uh, like uh, many of those C-related languages. There are nowadays, I mean, also there's a front end for the Go programming language, for Python and um, yeah, for, for, for multiple languages, which um, makes it really nice because then uh, once you can compile your source language to some intermediate representation, which is the same, right? It's all LLVM IR. Then you can apply all optimizations, all analysis, which work on the IR, no matter what the original source language was. So pros um, for, yeah, no nesting, right? No loops um, because um, loops and branches are represented by jumps conditional or unconditional jumps. 
you only have some very simple basic operations so you can add some stuff you can multiply some stuff right so basic arithmetic you can have some jumps and um, function calls and it's also it's, it uses something which is called three address code i don't care to explain what that is uh, here but you can look it up if you're interested in that and on the negative side there is no direct mapping from llvm ir back to source code so you are losing a few information in the compilation process unless unless you enable debugging information so if you ask your clan compiler to produce llvm ir and then if you also set the debug flag dash lowercase g to include debugging information the compiler will attach some debugging information which you can then later on use to to map it back to source code level to some extent but um, it's it's a bit harder so here's the general workflow you have some source language which you compile down into some intermediate representation using the front end which is a front end compiler such as clang and um, um, then you run some optimizations and analysis and um, eventually on your analyzed code you run your compiler's back end which then from that optimized and tuned intermediate representation produces the final target code for the target architecture and then you have your target language right okay let's have a closer look at control flow graphs so here we have a code fragment for which we um, can compute the control flow graph and this control flow graph is a bit um, let's say primitive because many things in static analysis are undecidable so the problem here is that if p and if not p and we as developers of course we can i mean p given some predicate which evaluates to a bool at the end of the day and we as developers can see of course that those branches are mutually exclusive right we can only have one or the other so a better way to write it maybe in source code even would be if p else and then you have that second branch in using an else instead of not p but essentially it's the same thing um, the problem here is that an analysis depending on the complexity of that predicate p the mutual exclusiveness cannot be inferred and therefore the control flow graph looks like that which is a bit odd but that's the best you can do so that's the control flow graphs have to over approximate have to be on the conser conservative side uh, right um, in order to get it correct because um, say you have a static analysis which um, doesn't know any better and then it just says yeah okay i mean this, this can never happen it just under approximates um, and then if you base a compile optimization on on that answer really and then it turns out that it actually can happen in, in some very rare occasions your program would be incorrect right which is terrible so if you use static analysis for compile optimizations, you always wish your analysis to over approximate information. So if it doesn't know any better, it just say, okay, I can't tell you any better. Um, could be, could not be, I, I can't tell. And then the compile optimization is not applied because the given property cannot be really ensured in every case. <coughs> so, Control for graphs are conservative. If control uh, in control may flow from statement A to statement B, then there's an edge from A to B. But the opposite is not true. I hope that makes sense. Problem is undecidable. Why is that? Because I mean, imagine P is a predicate which um, which is I don't know is prime, and then you give it a large number. Um, yeah, I don't know. A static analysis cannot evaluate that on the fly right um, or if p is even a runtime value a value that depends on some input uh, from a user um, i mean static analysis is static right the program is not executed so we don't know any runtime values so we just have to um, approximate and say okay we can't tell over approximation no. 
And the real control flow graph also, of course, needs to take into account exceptions, and then you would also have um, control flow edges that uh, depict the exceptional control flow. Otherwise, it would be unsound. And sound is also a thing. So if your analysis is sound, that means it does not forget any behavior, right? So it states the whole behavior or it even over approximate, but it does not forget something. And then you can also have unsound analyses, um, which may forget some stuff, which is a terrible thing to do if you wish to use your analysis information to base uh, compiler optimization on that. That's terrible. Then your analysis always need to be sound. But for some applications, like for instance, say you wish to find security vulnerabilities, you may don't care about soundness because you are happy if you find a vulnerability, um, right? That you, because then if you fix that vulnerability, you have one less vulnerability uh, in your program and that's better than nothing, right? So um, let's perform a real analysis and let's see how it works. So analysis, um, let's have an analysis that answer the, answers the question, what values are printed given that piece of code? And of course, you as developers, ex as experienced developers nowadays, you can see what values are printed right away. But let's say we would need to encode that. Let's, need, let's say we need to write a structured algorithm which finds uh, what values are printed. So how would we do it? And by the way, this analysis would be called reaching definition analysis. So use data flow analysis, use a structured way to find that uh, information that we are interested in. And first thing that do, of course, I already mentioned it is to um, construct the control flow graph, right? Which looks as follows. Uh, that is control flow, the edges in black, yeah. Okay, so uh, what do we do? In data flow analysis, we propagate data flow information through the control flow graph. What is data flow information? Um, data flow information is a bunch of data flow facts that make a statement about the property you are interested in. Um, in our case here, uh, in this example, our data flow facts are pairs of variables and respective value at a given time. Okay, and we are propagating a set of data flow facts here in our case for this analysis. And let's start at the beginning of that program fragment here. And at the beginning, what do we know? We know nothing, right? We don't know what value x has. So we just propagate x and then unknown value. Okay, and what the what a data flow algorithm now does, in fact, it would be the monotone framework here, some work list algorithm. We now would look at the first, or the analysis now looks at the first statement. And what do we do? We see an assignment where some constant integer literal one is assigned to the variable x. And what we can now do is we can look at the facts that uh, are known before that very statement. And here we find that we don't know x's value before that statement. And then we look at that statement and we see, okay, okay, a constant integer literal is written to x. And then we know that x's value after that statement must be one. I mean, I guess it's clear, right? Doesn't uh, need any further explanation. So, and then we have a look at the next statement, which is a print statement. And here we uh, print X. So here we can look, okay, what is the value? Do we have a value for X? So we look in, into our input set of data flow facts, which currently contains at this point, X is one equal to one. Then we can already tell at this point, okay, here one will be printed as a value. And otherwise, that print x statement doesn't do anything to x, so the value of x is unmodified. We just pass it as identity. Okay, so after that statement, it, x is still one. Okay, then we have some if condition that is checked. So we check if z is greater than zero. That 
check doesn't do anything to x, it doesn't modify x in any way, so we need to propagate that data flow fact x is equal to 1 along this branch here. Um, now I'm not sure what, what comes next here, if I need to explain this edge or that statement first. I don't know, maybe let's explain that statement first. So We now next um, analyze this statement here. So and we see, okay, now we have the constant integer literal 2 written to store to x. And we have a look, x prior to that statement has the value 1, carries the value 1. And because of that statement, we know that x after that statement must carry the value 2. Right? <laughs> okay, and that was exactly the wrong order. So x is 2 after that statement that we know for a fact. And if we follow that branch here, um, I mean, nothing happens here, so we remain, uh, we, we just propagate it as identity and x is still 1. Okay, now we have a very interesting point in the program because what we have is we have a control flow merge point. We have now a common successor statement where we have multiple control flow edges merging. And merge is the correct keyword here because we now need to merge our data flow facts that we have obtained along different branches, along different control flow edges. So we need to merge the data flow fact x is 1 and we need to merge the data flow fact x is 2. And the merge operator can depend on your analysis semantics. In our case we can just use set union as, an ex, uh, as a merge operator. So we would um, merge using set union which would give us the result okay x at this point in the program can either be 1 or 2. And so then finally we can also answer the question what can be printed at the second print statement and here we can say okay 1 or 2 can be printed, right? And this would be the data flow edges here, that is where the data flow is indicated by the green edges. Alright, I guess that wasn't too hard um, and I guess you already could figure it out if just by looking at the um, program fragment here. But that is a structured algorithm, and of course that algorithm also works for more complex problems. Let's have a more complex program, uh, problem and program <laughs> where you can't tell as a developer in, in, in a matter of seconds, but if you implement the strategy I just described on the last, hand sli on the last slide here, um, that algorithm can run in a, in a matter of milli or even nano milliseconds probably. Right. And you as a developer, you would uh, need some more time to detect what's going on. So let's ask the question, which assignments are unnecessary? Um, here we have a piece of code. And here now we wish to decide, okay, what, what assignments can be safely deleted without um, uh, changing the behavior of the program? And what is the observable effect of that program? The only thing that can be observed by a user is that print y statement here, right? Because here y, the correct value of y must be printed, otherwise the user of the program will be unhappy. Okay? So that would be called live variables analysis, by the way, an analysis that figures out uh, the answer to that question. So let's do it. Let's build the control flow graph. Um, that's relatively easy, right? Um, and now, Let's answer the question using our algorithm. So, print y. So we know for a fact that this print y statement must work. So, and on the last slide, for the last example, we started our analysis at the beginning of the program. <laughs> but we don't always have to do that. We can also have our data flow analysis start at the end of a program. That would then be called a backward analysis. And in this case, that would be more suitable here because we wish to um, make this statement work. Let's just apply the algorithm. At the beginning, we don't know anything because we haven't looked at the program yet, so we can't tell anything, right? So, and then we look at this statement and we wish to make this statement work. And in order for that statement to work, we need the value of y, because the value of y must be printed here, so we need y as a fact. And we, and here we also put it in a set, so we have a set of variables that we need and that set only contains y at this point here. 
And that said, now we propagate along all the control flow edges here and we see what's going on. Um, we see that uh, assignment here from a constant integer literal to z and we see, okay, that statement doesn't do anything to y, so we just pass y as identity as is. That, that statement has no effect on y whatsoever, right? Then we have a condition that is checked. And since we need y in all branches here, right, we must also now have the variable z because the condition here is checked against z. And if we wish to come from, uh, if we wish to, if we yeah, propagate our data flow information along this branch, we need to have z to make that check work here, right? So z is added to the set of data flow facts, the set of variables that must be available to make the program work. Here we have an interesting statement here because here we have a statement where y obtains it, its value from z. y obtains its value from z. So y is overwritten and we don't know, uh, we don't need the old value of y. That means we can just um, remove y from the set of data flow facts and we can, we, at this point, we just need z to make the remaining code work. Okay. All right. So then we need to merge here. We need to merge again. We need to merge y and z. And here also we just do set union as a merge operator. So we, we need y and z here. This condition, this check here doesn't do anything to our data flow effect. So we just continue propagating y and z. Then we have an integer, uh, the, the, the definition of y where we have uh, two initialize, uh, use two to initialize y. So that means before that statement, we can't now y, right? So we can remove y from the set of data flow facts. Then we just continue to propagate our set of data flow facts, which currently only contains e. Then we have a statement where the variable x is defined and initialized with the value one, but that doesn't do anything to our variable z. So we just propagate as is and then we have um, so our variable z defined with some initial value which we don't care for but at this point we also know we have z at this point and z cannot be possibly known before that so we are left with an empty set of data flow facts and now our propagation is done we have our results and how can we now read which assignment statements are unnecessary that's relatively easy because we can now have a look at the data flow information. We can now have a look at the data flow information and we can remove all statements for which the inset and outset, that's by the way how you call the various sets. So like say for this statement here, that set would be the inset and that set would be the outset or the other way around, depending whether you do a forward or a backward analysis, right? <clears throat> and whenever the input and output set does not change, the assignment statement can be removed. And that is the case here, right? Because that, I mean, we never need that statement here because the data flow information remains the same. So that can be removed, right? And we also have a situation here where the data flow information is not changed in and out sets both contain y or are both the same in uh, same set and so that also means we can remove that statement and if our analysis would be a bit more intelligent we would also be able to remove that condition because i mean z is not really needed and then we can repropagate but then in that case our analysis would need to be a bit more uh, sophisticated but if you just assume we have that very simple algorithm, which I just described here or explained, um, uh, then we could cross all these statements here. All right, I hope that makes sense to you. So findings, um, assignments to X and Z can be eliminated. Great, great. So that looks rather easy. Is it really that easy? How about loops? Um, Reaching definitions revisited. Let's have one more program here. And let's again ask the question, what value can be printed here? What values 
of x can be printed. And now we have a problem. Because if we have the control flow graph, which is that one, that is easy, of course. But if we propagate the data flow facts here in that example, we have a problem. At the beginning, we don't know anything. So x has an unknown value. Then after that um, declaration of x and initialization, we know that x must be 1. And we can propagate that. So if the y loop is never entered, then we know that x is 1 and here 1 can be printed. But now also we need to consider that control flow edge here uh, in case the y loop is entered. Then x is 1, we see an increment, and then we know, okay, after the increment x is 2. So x can have the values 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5, da, 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 da. so we don't know when to stop iterating, right? The problem here is that um, a static analysis typically can't evaluate the conditions because the conditions in virtually all cases depend on some runtime values which are at static which are statically at compile time so to say not known and for that reason we have to iterate and um, but in <laughs> here we have a problem because we have an infinite loop right and uh, eventually we can't tell anything so the right answer would be yeah, any value could be printed from one to i don't know infinity um, but uh, the problem here is that the algorithm would not even terminate because it would be stuck within that loop. So the number of iterations must be bound, right? We need to bind the number of iteration, iterations in order to have the algorithm terminate. And there's a mathematical theory. So what you would typically do is you would organize your data flow facts in what is called a mathematical lattice, right? which has a bottom element specifying no information. It has a top element specifying, okay, all information in the world, I, I don't know. And then you have some, uh, yeah, uh, you can also draw a Hasse diagram, diagram. If you know a Hasse diagram, then you can organize your flow facts in, in such a diagram. And at control flow merge points, you, ju you just go up in the lattice. Um, at, at some point you reach top, and then a top value cannot be modified anymore because top states all information in the world. I don't know better. And then your algorithm terminates. If you don't know what a mathematical lattice is, never mind. You can look it up if interested, but it doesn't, uh, is not required here. So, but we have a theory for that. Uh, that is called the monotone framework here, which, um, yeah, specifies what needs to be done in order to make the algorithm work in all instances. So the number of iterations must be bound. The uh, flow functions must be monotone. What is a flow function? A flow function, by the way, is something which is applied to each statement of your program. And a flow function uh, so gets your statement as an input. And the flow function states how the input to output set um, must be modified according to the given uh, statement. So a flow function describes what effect a given statement has on the input flow facts and output flow facts, right? Okay. So what are the parameters of a monotone framework? You need an analysis direction. We already saw that in, on, in our examples. So we can go forward or backward depending on the analysis problem. One or the other could be more um, optimal. We need an analysis domain organized in a lattice. So we need uh, to say, yeah, what are the data flow facts we're interested in? And we need to organize them in a lattice. <coughs> we need to have something which describes the effects of statements on our information, on our data flow facts, which is done by the flow functions I just mentioned very briefly. We need to have some initial values, so values in the lattice, and initial values are typically uh, I know nothing or I know everything, so the top or bottom elements. Um, typically, if I start with a data flow analysis, I don't know anything, so I start with bottom, right? Um, and then I also need an, a merge operator. I need a way to merge information obtained along different control flow paths. 
and that is a binary operator which operates on set of uh, sets of lattice values. Okay. So, and if I have all those things specified, so those are basically my five parameters I need for the monotone framework. And the cool thing which I can then do is I can have a uniform evaluation algorithm, which is parameterizable on those five parameters. And any concrete static analysis is basically just specifying those five parameters. Flow functions mainly and initial va values mainly. I just omit the other things. And once you specify that for a concrete analysis, you can just apply the uniform evaluation algorithm, which is typically something implemented as a work list algorithm. You can look up the literature, just Google for a monotone framework. It has been published in the prestigious journal Acta Informatica. So very great paper. In the algorithm for the monotone framework in the intra procedural case, that really fits on one slide. So it can't be that hard, right? Here I have um, put the algorithm from a textbook. Oh, um, Principles of Data Flow Analysis is the name of the textbook if you're interested. And um, <clears throat> I know that that algorithm looks a bit Greek and complex, but if you figure out what all the symbols mean, and it takes a while, unfortunately, if you but if you have figured out what the symbols mean, that algorithm is really easy to implement. It's it's one afternoon, it's, it's one massive while loop, right, which iterates until nothing changes anymore and you have reached your final answer. Um, uh, never mind, but but it's it can be it can be done. It's relatively easy. So why is it so hard? <laughs> because because typically we don't wish to have intra-procedural analysis, but we wish to have inter-procedural analysis. So those are analyses that span uh, that span multiple multiple functions, and for that we need a call graph. So say we have a function foo which calls other, uh, another function bar at a call site which we um, denote CS1 for call site 1. Then we have a function bar, then we have a function main which calls foo at some call site which we denote CS2 and then we say we have another call to bar at a call site which we call CS3. And then we can construct a call graph, right? So we start, uh, we also can write an algorithm for that, which iterates all those functions. Say the algorithm starts at main as the functions, uh, as the program's entry point. And then we see that first uh, call site to foo. And okay, we introduce another node uh, that present, represents the function foo. And on the edge, maybe we just um, print or attach the call site at which call site foo has been called with a main. Then we also see that main also calls, uh, no, then we continue our analysis in foo and in foo we also see, okay, a bar is being called at the call site CS1. Okay, we just also introduce a node for the function bar. Ah, by the way, sorry, that's, it's so clear for me, I uh, completely forgot to explain. In a call graph, a node represents a function and an edge represents a call to a function. I guess that has been clear now, uh, as I just explain how, how it works. <laughs> so and then in main, we also have a function called bar uh, at call site CS3. Okay, okay, okay. And you, you can see, okay, you can say, okay, that's very easy, right? Because I mean, I just call the functions by name and then I just have to iterate the program in order to construct the call graph. And that is correct, that is really easy. <laughs> But that's only easy because I have I, I came up with such a simple example code. It's not always that easy because um, in C and C++ you also oftentimes have function pointers. And a function pointer <coughs> is a variable, right, which, which refers to a function and you can call that function pointer. And a function pointer can of course also be set conditionally. And the condition may depend on a runtime value. So say if the user inputs some, I don't know, some data X, then the function pointer is set to foo. And then if the um, user inputs some other value, the function pointer is set to bar. 
And then at some point, somewhere else in your program, the function point has been called. And then you can't tell statically. Then you have a problem. And the problem is, okay, first of all, you need to determine the potential targets that this function pointer call goes to, namely foo and bar. And if you need to have a static call graph, you can have the situation that at the same call site, at one call site, you can have multiple callee targets because you can't decide statically what is being called. And then you just assume that both can happen at the same time for the sake of a data flow analysis on top on um, your call graph. And then also you have virtual dispatch. That means um, in C++ you can also have virtual functions. And then it depends on the runtime type, what function is actually being called, then it also becomes all of a sudden really, really complex. You can also have multiple uh, callee candidates that can be called at a given call site. So it gets complex, uh, a lot more complex quite fast. <coughs> so I'd say, <coughs> sorry, uh, let's say we have a call graph. And with, with the help of that call graph, we can now establish something which is called an ICFG, an inter-procedural control flow graph. That is, you have a call, you have a control flow graph, which also at calls also connects the statements with the uh, respective statements of the callee targets. That is then called an inter-procedural control flow graph, an ICFG. And on an ICFG, you can run an inter-procedural data flow analysis. How does it then work? Let's say, let's have the following example. Let's say we have a function T, let's say we have a function S, and function T and S both call some function R, and then of course function R returns at the respective call sites here to T and to S. And let's say we have a data flow analysis that we have uh, that we start in T. So in T, we propagate our flow facts in those sets, right, along all those different statements, mm. and see and we apply the flow functions on the individual statements to see how the statements interact and change the data flow information. And at some point, we have a call to a function which has been resolved by our call graph algorithm. And what we then do is, and that's very easy, we can just propagate our data flow information that we have at this point into the callee function R. We will need to do some parameter mapping, right? Map actuals to formats, and but that's not particularly hard. Then we continue propagating the flow facts within R, and then we have a problem. <laughs> because if we reach the exit point of the method R, we now have our flow facts and we need to return those flow facts and map those flow facts back into the caller context. So into the context of the thing that called us. And here we have a problem because at this point we have multiple call sites calling the function R, which would be this one and this one. And therefore we also have multiple return sites, this one and this one. And at this point in the algorithm is, we don't know where we need to return our flow facts, our data flow facts. We have no context information, so we don't know where we need to return our flow facts. We don't know where we came from. And so we need to return the flow facts everywhere. So we need to return the flow facts that we have computed here so far to this return site and also to this return site. Although, that return site here would be never feasible in practice because we came from this call site. And at runtime, if we came from this call site, we can only return to this return site. But statically, if we just apply the monotone framework directly on an ICFG, we have no clue. And we, we must return to all return sites possible. And you can only imagine that this like destroys precision. So you don't have any precise results. So, caution. The monotone framework cannot be used directly for interprocedural analysis. I mean, it can be used directly, but it is too imprecise. So, 
you don't get any interesting meaningful result. So we have to consider what is called calling contexts. That is, we need to keep information um, on where to return. That is called calling context information, which we need to append to the data flow set. There are solutions to that. There are solutions to that. There's the so-called call string approach. There's also the fun uh, a functional approach where you compute function summaries, which you can then apply into each calling context to circumvent this problem here. Mm. But it's, it's, it gets more difficult quite easily. So problems with usable static analysis. So, I mean, it's, it's still a research field, so we have not solved all problems and will never be able to do that, but um, we are making progress and we still have a lot of problems here. Um, precision versus performance. Static analysis oftentimes does not scale well. If you wish to come to precise solutions, scalability goes down the hill, basically. And if you, if you employ fast analyses, um, typically the results are not very precise. So that's a dilemma. Um, static analysis often has uh, massive runtimes and memory consumption. Sophisticated solutions often retire, uh, require really complex algorithms, and I mean really complex. Um, so that is algorithms that you can barely understand. And it takes you several days to weeks to get to get to know how the algorithm actually works. So really complex stuff. And um, <clears throat> I'm not a guy who is frightened ab uh, of complex algorithms, but uh, yeah, this involves really heavy stuff. Uh, so that is uh, me during the day many times, <laughs> and my colleagues as well, of course, uh, who also work on such things. Abstractions make it even more difficult. So we have function calls, right? And we, we, we need to incorporate all that good stuff. We also have exceptions with, which need, need to be modeled. So it's hard and undecidable problems everywhere. So in many places we need to approximate to get uh, useful results at all. So that is difficult. What are the pros and cons of automated static analysis? Uh, there are, are also some benefits, right? Which is why static analysis is employed at all. So they are typically much faster, or not typically, they are much faster than manually audits, right? If you implement it as an algorithm, it can run like blazingly fast, much faster than manual audits by having people looking at the source code. It's uh, much cheaper than manual audits for that very reason, right? It finds as much as, uh, almost as much as manually audits, which is a good thing. It, it's really efficient for obvious vulnerabilities that you really have a good understanding of. It uh, detects useful hints for more complex programs. So for more complex programs, say, you sometimes don't get the concrete solution, but you get good hints where it goes wrong. And then you can use that information still to make the most of it and uh, kind of track down a bug or vulnerability. And also for the users of static analysis, um, they only require basic knowledge um, of security, for instance, if you employ security analysis in order to be able to understand the warnings issued by the analysis. It's le less flexible than a human analyst, of course. I mean, once it's encoded, it's like fixed, right? And the human can also think about it um, more dynamically. Um, it has difficulties for staged attacks and more complex attacks and it can be harder. And it also cannot interpret human language. So say uh, you have some function which looks suspicious, uh, looks suspicious but then you have some code comments because the guy who wrote that function committed uh, the code. But of course, the analysis cannot interpret human language, cannot interpret code comments and the documentation of, of that program or piece of software. It yields too many results. Oftentimes you have lots of findings. So you run your analysis on a large project 
and then the analysis uh, issues 10,000 warnings or, or vulnerability, possible vulnerabil vulnerabilities, which is, I mean, doesn't buy you very much because no developer in the world wants to go through 10,000 issues many of which are not even real vulnerabilities. It just has been reported because of some over approximations of some analysis tool. False positives, that's a real problem. Irrelevant results, also a real problem and tough to implement. I mean, on the last slide, I told you that the algorithms are really tough and yeah, it's, it's complex. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, there's also a course that we offer at our Secure Software Engineering Group, which is called Designing Code Analysis for Large-Scale Software Systems. In short, it's called DECA. And nowadays, it's also, it has been split in DECA 1 and DECA 2. DECA 1 is concerned with the intra-procedural analysis, so where we have a, um, a world in which we can also fix some stuff. And then we have DECA 2, which comes up with the heavy problems I like inter procedural analysis um, and the things that you can employ to, to make it still work and uh, like real world tools and problems. So very interesting course. Uh, it's given the lecture is given by Eric Bodden, our professor. And in terms of contents, it um, goes through intra versus in uh, so intra procedural data flow analysis call graph construction algorithms context insensitive inter procedural data flow analysis context sensitive context sensitivity using the call strings approach for instance value based context so what 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 you can do about uh, the context sensitivity issue also discussing the functional approaches um this course also explains the distributive frameworks which you can use to um, implement or which you can use to follow the functional approach to context sensitivity. Then you can use data flow solvers called IFDS, IDE, weighted pushdown systems, or even synchronized pushdown systems. So really interesting stuff, state of the art stuff. And also this course discusses current challenges in inter-procedural static program analysis. And also hints and makes connections to applications to software security. Um, you can, of course, enroll in that course or in that courses. It's two, like it's DK1 and DK2, right? So you can check the Paderborn University's course catalog. But you can also just go to our YouTube channel because Eric also uploads the lecture videos. So you can, if you're interested in that and um, have nothing better to do, you can also have a look at uh, the DK1 and DK2 course at your, or on YouTube. Very interesting, highly recommend if you're interested in that kind of topic anyways. Mm. And there's also another nice course um, on YouTube, um, which you can check out. And the lecture is called Foundations of Programming Languages by Christoph Reichenbach, um, who recorded that lecture at the SAPL University, uh, what was it, Software Engineering Programming Languages group, I believe that was the acronym, um, at the Goethe University Frankfurt am Main. That, uh, I mean, is at least the, the recordings are from that time. Christoph is now at Lund University in Sweden. Um, I'm not sure if he also still uploads his uh, lectures on YouTube. I hope so, because it's really interesting for many students. You can also check out his lecture. Here's a link. And um, in his lecture, he talks about optimizations, so compiler optimizations and static analysis. He explains what is going on, why do we do it, and how does it work? So answers the, the main relevant questions here. Exactly. So <clears throat> then let's have one more example to show you that it's all about creativity. So I told you once that, yeah, user-defined operators are not possible in C++. Um, here I wish to give you a counter example, at least to some extent. So I hope, hope that is close enough to user-defined operators um, to satisfy you. So let's have a look. First of all, you cannot define custom operators in C++. Already told you that, and that's still valid, and it still holds, of course. But what about the following? What about yeah, let's have some integer, whoopsie. Let's have some integer A, and then let's have some integer 
C, which is A, multiply with 20. Or let's have some integer D, which is A times C. I mean, is it close enough for a user-defined operator? So that is actually valid C code that can be written if you prepare your program a bit. <clears throat> so this can be realized in C++ itself. So and here I show you how I did it. Um, first of all, you need to have some global symbols. So you need some symbols like multiply or times which are globally accessible such that you can use them, right? And for that reason, I created an enum and I did not create an enum class because I don't wish to have type safety. I wish to avoid type safety because I wish to have globally accessible symbols. So I just use a plain enum. You should not typically not do that in practice, right? Um, multiplication and I give that enum some members times multiply mult cool. I don't know what you want. So just give it some symbols. And um, we need a tiny wrapper for integers to trick the type system. And here is a mistake. Let me maybe quickly fix that. I'm sorry for this, that I have to interrupt here. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, so let's try that again. Oopsie daisy. Okay. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's great because it's PowerPoint, it's a Microsoft tool, so it doesn't work correctly, of course. Um, so here's an underscore. Okay, let me try to explain it anyway, so even if it is not shown correctly. So we need a tiny integer wrapper to trick the type system. Um, so for that reason, we create a new type using a struct, which we call underscore. Unfortunately, you can't see that underscore here. Um, we create a new type called underscore int, which is not the built-in int, but it's a user-defined type called underscore int. We can, of course, do that, right? Mm. Then we give our underscore int an integer as a data member, because an underscore int should just represent an ordinary integer. And we also give it a constructor, an underscore int constructor, which takes an ordinary built-in integer and initializes the data member i with that constructor's parameter i. Okay, so what that means is because the constructor is not, not marked here as explicit, that means we can now convert a built-in integer into our underscore integer. That conversion works. We now also need a backward conversion. We now also need an automated implicit conversion which allows us to convert our underscore int to an ordinary built-in integer. And you can look it up. I never explained that to you explicitly, if I recall correctly. There is also an implicit conversion operator that you can implement for your own data type. <coughs> so the next operator here is an implicit conversion operator. And it implements an implicit conversion to int. Um, which just returns the underlying integer that is stored here. So by implementing that conversion operator to int, that allows to implicitly convert variables of your type underlying, uh, underscore integer to ordinary built-in integer. So we now have the possibility to get an underscore integer from an ordinary integer by a constructor and by the conversion operator we can go back and um, convert implicitly from underscore integer to ordinary integer. Okay, so far so good. What next? Now we can kind of trick the type system to make it work. Um, we can implement the uh, division operator here. And we can have on the left hand side an integer i, ordinary integer i, I mean a is an integer. On the right hand side we have a multiplication, which uh, is also true because on the right hand side we have multiply, right? This is multiply and um, multiply is something of type underscore multiplication, okay? And um, 
in the overload here of that division operator, what we return is we return something of type underscore integer. So I'm sorry for the missing underscores, but uh, I don't know, PowerPoint uh, freaks out as always. Um, so what we're doing is here, we just wrap our integer on the left-hand side into an underscore integer and just return it as a result, okay? And then we overload the division operator once more for other types, namely with an underscore int on the left-hand side and an ordinary int on the right-hand side. And that overloaded division operator would be the second one, right? So the left one, this division operator is evaluated first, right? So what happens? Integer on the left-hand side, something of type multiplication on the right-hand side, the result is under the result of that thing if evaluated is something of type underscore int and then the second division operator here is evaluated where we now have the result of this expression which is underscore int right and on the right hand side it's ordinary int so this is why it works here right underscore int ordinary int and the result is just a plain ordinary integer which is j times k all right, and this allows you to write the following code and it really compiles and it also works and does what you want it to do. So that can be realized. If you don't believe me, you can really just type it into your favorite editor, compile it and run it. And be aware of the missing underscores here at some points, right? Um, sorry for that. So, and um, how about associativity, left or right associative? It depends on how you overload the, left, uh, the, the division operators, oh, but that can also be handled. And this is just meant to be a joke, right? I mean, it's funny and uh, you can use it and uh, surprise your friends, but <laughs> I highly recommend to not use that in real projects. I hope that is uh, clear. All right, so now we are almost done. Let me briefly talk about jobs and thesis. Um, <clears throat> Topic-wise, we can offer something, in, uh, something related to static analysis in our research group. C++ programming, that is also one topic. Also we do program analysis for Java as well. So if you're more interested in Java and more comfortable with that language also works. Um, we are working with the LLVM framework. We are also working with the so-called SUIT framework, which is a static analysis framework for Java. So that would be it topic wise, what we can offer. Benefits um, of jobs in our research group money of course and um, i know for a fact i mean i could use some good money too as a student so that is also a good point fun um, we are all nice people so don't be afraid of those complex topics we don't um, pull students heads off so i mean <laughs> we, we are taming the problems here and um, even if it uh, sounds complex but um, we, we make it suitable for students, so don't be too afraid. It's still fun to work in our research group. You will definitely learn a lot. Uh, I hope you already figured out through this course here that uh, there's lots of things that you can and need to learn, but you will have the opportunity to do that. You will also be invited to our professional and social events of our research group. That also uh, is a good benefit uh, you then have also opportunities for bachelor and master thesis so oftentimes we have some student assistants which work for us and um, or work with us i should rather say and they work on some interesting topics and solve some problems and sometimes based on the topics they are working on a bachelor or master thesis arises and um, then it's a really natural development to um, just have a bachelor or master thesis written on the stuff that you're already working on. That's typically a very good thing to do. And you have those opportunities here in our research group. You also have lots of career options. So people who know C++ very well, people who know LLVM very well, people who know Clang very well, people who know static analysis or program analysis in general, static and dynamic and those people are in high demand. Um, those people are really high paid later on. So if you want to make some good money and if that is fun to you, it, it should be fun to you. Otherwise you wouldn't make it probably because then the topic is too hard. And if you don't have fun working on those topics here, you don't overcome hard times, 
So that's, uh, I'm just being honest here. But uh, you have lots of career options here following those kind of topics. And you are also working on important topics, right? So software company companies building their own software products really need those kinds of tools that we are developing in our research group. So that is really highly important. So just drop me an email if you're interested. And I, if I don't have a topic for master thesis or jobs myself, that might, may also happen, but then I can distribute it across our colleagues here or across my colleagues. And then we can figure something out, I believe. So just drop me an email if you're interested. And to recap, um, we today we talked about program analysis, real world findings. We talked in detail about static code analysis, about the custom operator hack, like on the one of the last slides here, right? And next time I will introduce you to the final project. And then, yeah, sadly, that would be already all of this lecture. Mm. I already mentioned that to a few of you, or I mentioned it in the um, exercise class. I, I can't remember right now, but there's currently a very good course of one of my colleagues uh, who developed an advanced C++ course, which you can kind of see as a C++ programming part two. Um, and I'm currently discussing with him such that we can make the materials of his course. I mean, he also has slide sets, of course, uh, if I recall correctly, he also recorded the lectures. Mm, I try if we can make that material available to you or even maybe publicly available to all interested students. Um, because if you're really interested in that, that would be a, a really good course to, to build on, um, to, to take after this very course here yeah, that you're just attending, right? So I, I'll try to figure something out and um, hope to come in agreement with my good colleague. All right, that would be it. Yeah, thank you very much and see you in today's exercise class. Bye bye.